In this video, I'm going to talk about Newton's second law, but not with F equals MA, but using momentum. Please read the success criteria I plan to cover in this video. So let's start by talking about Newton's second law. First of all, F equals MA was not the way he originally put it. A more correct version would be what I have below. The net force acting on an object is proportional to the rate of change of momentum. Remember the letter P stands for momentum. Momentum is just mass times velocity, and so most people think of this as being um, mass times the change in velocity over time. And now this is where we get change in velocity over time and mass equaling acceleration. Except for that's not the only way we can have a change momentum. We actually could have the mass changing as well. So let's step back for just a moment and talk a little bit more about the delta P. We call this the impulse. Now that could be caused by a change in mass or a change in velocity. So normally you've probably had questions so far that talked about a car speeding up or slowing down and that changed its momentum. But we could have something else such as a water truck that has a hole in it and it keeps dripping water and therefore its mass changes over time. Or race cars that are constantly using fuel and can then change their mass over time. We also have had questions where we have a train pulling into a loading bay and there's this constant mass per time being added into our train. So it's constantly getting heavier. Now in the IB we won't have both things changing at the same time. We'll either have F equals MA due to a change in its velocity or F equals the changing in mass at a constant speed and therefore we tend to have a change in mass per time. Now if I move that equation around I could also put it as force times time equals a change in momentum. Now that would only be true for a constant force. And if we look at our, dis our force time graph, that would be like a constant force happening over a constant time. And force times time in this diagram, if it was a constant force, would give me a rectangle. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge is telling you that it's the area under the line that would give us the impulse. The examples I have here are simple harmonic motion or a ball hitting a tennis racket. Now they wouldn't necessarily be a nice little triangle like this, but I've just simplified it so I could calculate the area a little easier. So let's think about this in terms of being in a car. If I'm traveling at a certain speed and I have to stop, that means my change of momentum will be m and my change of velocity, whatever I had to begin with until I stopped. Now, no matter what car I'm in, if I was traveling at 30 meters per second, I will have a certain force acting over a certain time that needs to happen to cause that change in momentum or that impulse. So if there's anything that will increase the amount of time it takes for me to slow down, that will actually decrease the force that has to be applied to me in order to make that happen. First of all, let's talk about crumple zones. Those are the areas like, for example, here in the car. If I have a big huge truck that's going to hit me and hits right here, that will take time for that force to be applied as the front of my car crumples. Likewise with seat belts, yes they hold you in place, but they're actually going to take a while before the maximum restraint is going to occur. Again, it's going to then increase the amount of time or decrease your force. Airbags will do the same thing. It's another reason why when you jump off a table and you land, you always bend your knees. Bending your knees will increase the time it takes for you to stop. It will increase the time it takes for the impulse to be applied. And that means you have a smaller force acting on your legs. Okay, so let's see how we can use Newton's second law using momentum in a couple questions. First of all, I have a tennis ball and it's traveling horizontally with a speed of 30 meters per second and is in contact with the wall for a time of 
5 times 10 to the minus 3 seconds, so 5 milliseconds. But afterwards, it actually is moving the opposite direction, and now it's traveling at 20 meters per second. So what we need is the average force on the ball. I've already said we're going to use this form of Newton's second law. And we need to think about the change in momentum. Well, in this case, we actually have a change in velocity. Our mass needs to be in kilograms. But our change in velocity is going to be 50. It was starting with 30, and now it's heading 20 in the negative direction. I'm just using the magnitude right here. And we're going to get 550 Newtons. The answer is D. Notice that if you only use the initial velocity or the final velocity, those incorrect answers were here too. Okay, let's do an example where the mass changes. I have water leaving a hose at a rate of 1.5 kilograms per second and a speed of 20 meters per second. We're going to assume that it's at a constant speed and it's aimed at the side of a car, which stops it. That means that my final speed of the water will be zero. So let's look at Newton's second law then with our impulse or change of momentum. Using this as mass over time times its velocity, we then have 1.5 kilograms per second multiplied by 20 meters per second. Notice the units are going to be kilogram meter per second squared. That's the same as a Newton. And we get our answer of 30 Newtons. So that would be the force needed to be applied to the water to stop it. That means with Newton's third law, the water applies that much onto the car as well. Okay, we have a mass of 50 kilograms that's going to be accelerated from 2 to 10 meters per second. And we're looking for the impulse that caused the acceleration. So impulse, delta P, and in this case the mass we'll assume is being constant. So that's going to be the change in velocity. If I've just put my values in here, we've got a change in velocity is 10 minus 2. And this will cause us to have a value of 400 Newton seconds. Notice the units for momentum or impulse are Newton second. We also could use kilogram meter per second, mass times velocity. Our answer here is B. Okay, here we go. We've got a graph here. We've got force versus time. Remember, the area under the line would tell us about impulse. And in this area right here, we don't have any area under the line, so there is no impulse. There's no change in velocity. But over here, we do. So the question says, when we've got a car stopped at the traffic light and then it changes to green, presses down sharply, that's why they're trying to explain this vertical line right here. Now after that we have impulse, and see the impulse keeps increasing, so that means our velocity will keep increasing. Another thing to think about is if we have a constant force acting on our car, we'll assume that that's the only one, it's a net force, and our car should accelerate. So if I looked at the answers, I should see a flat section at the beginning where it is just waiting, and because that's a constant force along here, I should have a constant acceleration. And on a velocity time graph, that will give me a straight line. That means this one is the right answer. Okay, we have a 1,200 kilogram car moving at 12 meters per second, colliding with a bigger car that's waiting at rest at a traffic light. After the collision, the cars are locked together and slide. Eventually, they come to a rest, and there's a force kinetic friction. Now, one thing to notice is that in this case, we have them colliding together, and they stick. So this is an inelastic collision. Calculate the speed of the cars locked together immediately after the collision. Well, even though it's an inelastic collision, we still can use the conservation of momentum. So remember, start it always by writing the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. And then before we have the 1,200 kilogram car moving at 12 meters per second, 
the other one's at rest, and afterwards they stick together, so we have 1200 plus 2300, and they're moving at a speed v. I'm just going to put a prime to say that that's the speed after. And when I pick up my calculator, I'm going to get 4.1 meters per second. Let me just write that up beside part A. Now, on to part B. Calculate the magnitude of the frictional force that brings the locked cars together to rest. And I should have here at a distance of 2.55 meters. So there's a few ways we can do this. So they have kinetic energy and that's going to go into the work done to overcome friction. So 1 half mv squared is going to be the force of friction times the distance that they travel. If I move this around, force of friction is going to be mv squared over 2d. And I have the answer of 1.2 times 10 to the 4 newtons when I use my calculator. Now you might say, well, what does this have to do with the Newton's law? Is we could have calculated this by a few different ways. If we wanted to, we could have done the force of friction, which would be the net force acting on it, times mass times acceleration. And I could have used our SUVAT to find acceleration as well, because we know that the distance is 2.55. Our initial velocity was 4.1. Our final velocity is zero, and then I could calculate the acceleration. And I could do that then in two steps. Either way is fine. Sometimes the energy values, though, are easier to do because we don't have to worry about um, vectors. So please just read through the success criteria one more time so that you can say yes, I can to all these statements.